Hi, John. Hi, Macon. How are you doing? I'm very well. How are you? I am pretty good. Refrigerator's broken, but other than that, everything <laughs> is doing very nicely. Oh, no. How, so uh, have you called the repairman already? Or? Well, I think I'm going to do that after this because if it really completely breaks down, then there's a lot of food in there. But is it not? Is it not totally broken yet? Yeah, it's just all of a sudden it, everything is warm instead of cold, and you know that's the beginning of something nasty because something very abrupt happened overnight. Yeah, it's like, so, like botulism. Or- it, <laughs> exactly. And so one does not want to take any risks with either botulism or a botched refrigerator. And so, yeah, so, but if only people had such small problems as those. And life could be worse. And how are yes. you? Uh, I'm pretty well. My, my puppy's in doggy daycare, and it's a beautiful day in Washington, D.C. Oh, good. So Very it's good. Uh, warm and spring like. It is. Really, because yes. I was down there yesterday, and it was, it was really not warm at all. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I piled out in my long underwear to watch the, walk the dog this morning. <laughs> yeah. And by sort of halfway down the block, I had to go back and change. Yeah, that's well, I'm glad that something has happened more positive meteorologically down there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to start with, people who are having uh, people who are having bigger problems than us, mm-hmm. uh, the Brookings Institute has a sort of shocking new study on income mobility out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the findings was that two out of three white kids grow up to have higher family income than their parents, but only one out of three black kids do. Mm-hmm. And this is something that you've written quite a lot about, mm-hmm. um, about the the why uh, black kids don't necessarily do as well in school or, or mm-hmm. income-wise. So I'd, I'd like to get your, your thoughts on that. Well, you know, I think that... There is a particular problem. I mean, many people would look at that study as evidence that racism of some kind, institutional racism, societal racism, still plays a big part in how well black people are capable of doing. And I don't think that that is as much the case as people say. And the way I tend to put it is that we look at a young black man, say between 18 and maybe about 45, And let's say that that black man has had trouble keeping a steady job. Let's say that maybe he has erred onto the wrong side of the law or something like that. It's often said that, for example, if that person is a drug dealer, and yes, there were white drug dealers, but I'm talking about a particular constellation of factors, especially in our inner cities. It's often said that, well, that's the best that that person could do. But the problem is that that guy has a brother who works for UPS, That guy has a brother who's a security guard. It's simply not true that ending up down on the bottom is the only possible fate for a guy like that. And so it seems to me that when we talk about this downward mobility, it's not because society condemns people to that. Society condemns a middle-class black person to that to more of an extent than it does white middle-class people. I think that... Within the community, there is a duty that the more fortunate have to show the less fortunate that there are more opportunities than we're often told that there are. And I think that without that being done, and it isn't done enough, I think it's very easy for a black person who starts at a certain point to end up not going as far as he or she might out of a sense that opportunities that are available are not. There's some problems with what is accepted as norms, I think. Right. I mean, one of the interesting things to me is that, in fact, drug dealing isn't even the best you can do. For most people, it has it's low, it pays lower than minimum wage. Exactly. Um, which is, so, in fact, people are getting stuck. Um, I, I, I'm not sure why. I mean, I guess it's the, the tournament theory that they're attracted by the idea of, uh, of being one of the kingpins. But That's what it is, people yeah. People don't make it. Right. Yeah. Nobody nobody wants to become a drug dealer in order to make minimum wage forever. The idea is that you might make the big score. And the fact of the matter is that very few people do. And that really, I think we all know that the wiser route would be to take a steady living wage with genuine prospects for advancement rather than a job where you make minimum wage and you have a vanishingly small chance of getting on top. And even if you do, you're probably going to go to jail and or get hurt. But it comes down to just a matter of what is considered normal. Like, for example, I'm going to mention something that I've, I've tried not to very much out of respect for what happened. But here in New York, there was a young black man, Sean Bell, 
who was killed by the police in a very unfortunate incident a year and change ago when he was outside of a club and they assumed that he had a gun. And it was a really unfortunate incident. He left behind a woman who was going to become his wife the day that he was killed and two children. And the fact of the matter is that that shouldn't have happened and nobody deserves to die. But if you look at the biography of that man, then you see that there is something else to be learned from that incident. One is that we need to have better training for the police. But two, that guy had a record of drug dealing, despite the fact that he had been a relatively promising student. He had gone to a decent high school, and he has these two kids, and he's about to marry his wife. And yet for him, in his environment, it was a norm to possibly make money selling stuff on the street. He had dipped in and out of it. He had a record on the basis of it. And what's interesting about it is that he was a nice guy. He was normal. He wasn't a monster. It was a matter of what people in his neighborhood did and what he grew up seeing as normal. The white kid in Scarsdale doesn't see people doing that. He doesn't think of it as normal, and so he's less likely to do it. I think that the Brookings study is partly charting what what would create, for example, a Sean Bell who would see it as normal, just ordinary, to sell cocaine on the street as a way of supporting himself and his wife rather than doing something else. That's something that I end up thinking about. Yeah, I have to say, I, uh, um, you know, when people start talking about culture, it, it's really fraught because on the one hand, I, I, I think that there is something to the poverty, the culture of poverty, mm-hmm. um, and and that, that that makes it hard to. But when you talk about it, you know, for conservatives, it, it often ends up being a kind of well, we're Punitive. just superior. And mm-hmm. and you know, I, what I've said is, well, how many of us had the courage to drop out of high school and sell crack? You know, I mean, you, you have true. your peer group, and you do what they tell you to do. I, my, if my friends had been swallowing razor blades, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> exactly. I was incredibly influenced by them. Yeah. Um, and, and, I mean, the actual, the interesting thing is that uh, apparently for, for black kids, the returns to education are actually higher than mm-hmm. for white kids, but somehow mm-hmm. they're not getting on that track. Yeah, it's and it really is just a matter of norms. You can talk about a culture of poverty, and many people assume that you're criticizing, when really it's just a matter of you do what you see people around you doing, and you're imprinted when you are very young. And in terms of the gains from education, being aware of that and valuing that is part of a culture for better or for worse. And so obviously this is something that recent immigrants internalize very much and sometimes they almost overdo it in terms of the pressure that kids can sometimes feel from immigrant families to not do just well, but very well. And in the black community, sometimes that is not the case. And unfortunately the sometimes is excessive because I think it does create unfortunate patterns. And so I think that the issue is to get the word out and to change what is considered Normal, And I think that, for example, Bill Cosby and Alvin Poussin's book, Come On People, that came out some months ago, is the way to go. And it's why I am rather dismayed at a tendency, in particularly in academia and to a lesser but vibrant extent in journalism, to think that mentioning the fact that racism still exists and the playing field isn't perfectly level is more important than showing people how to get beyond that. And so the Brookings study, I read about it and I thought, This is important to know, but I think it's going to be used for the wrong reasons. You can look at that study and you can just despair. And you can look at that study and just be reinforced in a sense that you understand that life isn't fair, and then move on and go have your refrigerator fixed. I think that what we need to do is look at a study like that and realize that it might be partly the system, but that there are also cultural messages that we need to reverse. Now, you've written that you uh, do not favor affirmative action for as a remedy for discrimination in education, mm-hmm. but that you do in the private sector. Um, yeah. Is, yeah. That, is that still true? That is definitely true. I think that um, affirmative action is important where there is evidence of an actual bias, where there's evidence of an actual tendency for people to not be given things that they deserve based on the system as it already is. And so I think, for example, affirmative action in university admissions made perfect sense for about the first 15 years of it. It was something that, if I could wave a magic wand, that would have been instituted from about 1966 to about 1982, because there really was 
the remnants of what had been a country that lived under Jim Crow and institutionalized segregation. There were real biases. But once it gets to the point that the reason that, for example, middle-class black kids may not be posting as high scores or grades as equivalent middle-class white kids is because of cultural factors, I don't think that lowering, lowering standards is the answer, and I think it ends up preserving the problem. But what's most important is that class... I do think is important in terms of preferences and admissions. I mean, certainly if you've gone to a lousy school, if you've had horrible family problems, et cetera, yeah, I think some adjustments need to be made in how well you're going to do on a test and things like that. But it shouldn't just be based on color. In the real world, though, for example, at a law firm, I can see there being a certain room for affirmative action because there, there are biases that can be identified still which are often based on the fact that there's a birds of a feather phenomenon. If you're making partner, part of it is how chummy you are with the people on top. That might not happen if you are more rooted in black culture, more comfortable with your own people than you are with the white guys who are running the firm. That means that you could do everything that you're supposed to do to make partner, but somehow you never manage to get there because you're just not, you're not one of the boys or one of the women in the way that the others are. One can adjust for that. I can understand having affirmative action policies to reverse that, but not when there's no evidence of bias. Right. Although I think the evidence is that the, the bias is actually worse with the like the very lowest skilled workers, and that um, I think they they did a study where they sent out resumes. I'm sure you've heard of this study. Mm-hmm. They sent out resumes under under different names, same resume, and saw how many people you know which resumes got called back. And mm-hmm. the evidence was that people with sort of tra- noticeably black names yeah. um, didn't get called back nearly as often. And I think that what they ended up finding was that uh, being a black low-skilled worker was the equivalent of being a white low-skilled worker with a felony conviction stated right. on their resume. Right. Um, and and that's where I like that's where I see sort of the most. But I think in in some ways that's where it's the hardest to remedy. Are you going to go around to every McDonald's and and uh, right. ask them to give people a bonus? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there there are things that it's hard to fix. And this is not an, a tired argument against big government or anything like that. But, right. yeah, that study, I call it the Dwayne and Tamika study, just because those are two emblematic names of that type. And, you know, there's more than one. That's real. Obviously, there is that bias, and that means that when we say racism still exists, we have something concrete to attach to it rather than just saying it genuflectively. But I take from that study, first of all, that it's not that Dwayne and Tamika can't get a job. We're talking about tendencies rather than what it would have been 40 years ago. And basically, I don't think we can fix that. And I find myself thinking that the solution to that is not just quota policies because often they create more harm than good. And, you know, it's interesting. A lot of my feeling about preferences and my kind of visceral visceral recoil from a lot of it is based on personal experiences and more to the point things that one sees because having been in academia having been a graduate student having competed for fellowships having gotten a job i've seen what the preferences culture is really like on the ground there's on the one hand what people like lee bollinger say stringing certain pretty words together the way it's described in the book the shape of the river by william bowen and Derek bach Then there's the actual experience of seeing the way, in particular, black and Latino people's work and black and Latino people as people are treated on the basis of this idea of quote-unquote diversity and inclusion. And a lot of it is really just painful. And so I understand the Dwayne and Tamika problem, but the question is what you do about it and whether you can do anything about it. And in that one, I would agree with you that I'm not sure we we can fix it. Yeah, I have to say, I I think as, as a woman... I always have this this debate with other women journalists who hmm. say, you know, it's harder to be a woman journalist, and, mm-hmm. and this is true. It is harder to be a woman it must journalist, be. Yeah. especially when you're in, um, you know, certain areas of, of knowledge like science and, and economics, which is what right. I mostly do. Right. But, you know, the, then there's the flip side of it, which is that you know people probably discount me for being female sometimes, but then sometimes I probably get jobs or speaking engagements that I wouldn't get if I weren't a woman. And, of, course. Um, of course. And so I think you end up in this weird this weird netherland where you don't really know. Um, you know yep. And I, I guess I shouldn't norm it, but I don't know how I would do if I were a man. But, do, you uh, fe- do you feel that it balances out in terms of the benefits and the disadvantages? Um, I think that ultimately it 
for me, I, I don't feel that I've had huge problems. I, I used to work for The Economist, which has a lot of mm-hmm. women doing economics, uh, a lot of what, what the editor, John Micklethwaite, used to call my three opinionated women. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and at The Atlantic, I've, I've certainly been treated fairly. But I, I, I do think that uh, sometimes, yeah, people comment on my appearance in a way that they wouldn't about a man. And, certainly. And, or they, they sort of say... I have people who will assume that I don't know what I'm talking about. Of and they, course. they condescend to me. And um, and I don't think that they would walk in with that same kind of swashbuckling, well, I'm going to show this idiot. And it's it's no. always when I know, like, it's always <coughs> some area where I, in fact, know more than they are. <laughs> right. Um, which is, you know, so, but, so, yeah, I, I think it helps me, it hurts me. I don't know which, which one ultimately. I mean, it, you know, you, you just always sort of, um, I think you think about it. Of course. Fairly often. I would um, say the exact same thing. Yeah, it, it must be a very different feeling to be just a, a man, in particular a white man, doing things. I kind of like my my life better. You know, in a way I find it more interesting. I would find your life more interesting than oh, being yeah, no, just I, a white I wouldn't guy. want to not be a woman. Yeah. I'm quite happy... Um, but it, it's just odd to consider that my life might be entirely different if I yeah. were. Um, it is. This might actually be a good, a good, uh, a good place to transition to talking about the election and uh, That's Hillary, right. uh, Hillary's swan song. Poor, poor Hillary. Yeah, wow. I actually, I, I, did, I did, I'm not a Hillary supporter. Um, Me either. Although, <laughs> I but saw still. your, de- I saw your debate with, uh, with Glenn Lowry. It was incredibly passionate. Oh wow, she's um, it's. So sad. I mean, I am an Obama person myself, but As am I. she has worked so hard, and she really—I really think—if you're gonna if you're gonna decide who is technically more qualified, she is, and it is very much her turn. She knows her policy, and she ends up getting up there thinking that she's going to take it because it's her turn and there's nobody else who could possibly beat her. You could see it a year ago. She really assumed that she was going to get that nomination. And here comes this guy who's got a nice crinkly smile and a certain way of speaking, and she thinks that she's just going to kick him to the curb by you know, basically saying she has more experience and maybe getting in some slightly slanderous points. And she doesn't realize that because Obama is what he is, if you criticize him, you're called either mean or a racist at worst. And that he has a way of speaking that's very powerful in this nation at this time, and that there's nothing she can do. There is absolutely nothing she can do to stop this person. I feel confident of saying that nothing's going to change next week. And I don't know why, but she touches me in a way that Gore, for example, did not. She's just, she's, she's being killed, and because she is a 60-year-old white lady who does not have a gift for public speaking and doesn't happen to be charming, and I think only because of that, she's going to lose. Yeah, and I think it must be, it's, it's sort of especially humiliating, right, because she had mm-hmm. the Clinton legacy behind her. Mm-hmm. And it has to be terrible to have gotten, I, mean, I remember looking at her in New Hampshire, and, and right after New Hampshire, the debate between her and Obama, and Obama just looked defeated. And she looked, you know, she yep. was energized, and now it's exactly the opposite, except that she's she's angry. Yeah, you, know, you can she's tell. Really, she had it snatched from her. Um, and I think that, you know, this is somewhere where I actually do feel... Um, for all that I don't support her, I, I do feel that it's especially hard to be a woman running for office. Oh, yeah. That it's prob- I, I don't know. Maybe it's harder. Maybe in some ways it's harder to be a black man because I'm sure that Obama... Harder for a is, woman, I think, now, actually. Yeah. Um, ...is never going to carry the South. But, you know, she's... To, you have to project strength. <laughs> mm-hmm. But if you project strength, all of a sudden, you know, you're a, a, a bitch. Are we allowed to say that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> if they bleep me, uh, you can guess what I just said. Right, yeah. Um, and, and that's really, really difficult. And it's something that all women who are professionals struggle with, is mm-hmm. trying to project authority without projecting aggression. It's and unfair. It's, um, and now that, you know, they, it used to be that you couldn't really sort of tell whether how much was bias and how much was real personality differences, but mm-hmm. now they've done studies, even in writing. Harvard cases <clears throat> show that if you just change the name from John to Jane, suddenly the perception of, of someone's leadership abilities shifts oh, dramatically. Lord. Yeah, it, it's, it's really, it's unfair, and there is a degree of hatred that Hillary Clinton attracts, which clearly is due to the fact that she's not a man. I mean, there are various things you can say against her, but none of it 
would create the kind of animus that she attracts, often from very intelligent, nuanced thinkers, if she were a man. She simply hasn't done anything to to merit it. It's just because people uh, feel threatened by, or I think not necessarily threatened by, I think people are viscerally repulsed by a strong woman, somebody who is not trying to be gracious the way, say, a Libby Dole or even a Nancy Pelosi sometimes can. Hillary doesn't do those things. And as a result, she is considered, I think, repulsive. And this is often by many women. Like, for example, the person at the McCain event who said, this must have been a good four months ago now, what are we going to do about the bitch? You know, there are women who feel that way about her. Well, my mother hates her. <laughs> my yeah, mother is on what basis? Yeah. I, she just... It's a visceral, just, she just can't stand her. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think part of it is that, that, that Hillary is cold. She, you know, she's yeah. reserved. And if, if it were a man, that might be perceived as strength, yep. maybe sort of coldly analytical. But in a woman, it's just perceived as, you know, somehow having defeminized themselves. Yeah, and she's not, all people aren't charming. And one thing you would not say about her is that she's charming, and that should have nothing to do with whether or not she gets a nomination, but it does. And I feel, I mean, for me, Obama is important because I, I have a wedge issue. For some people, a wedge issue would be something like abortion. For me, I really feel that we need to get beyond the point on race that we are right now, and I think this is a very important moment to do it with the new generation. And I am just narcoticized by the idea of a whole generation of people who, you know, there's a generation now who basically only knew Clinton for eight years. Imagine if there was a generation that watched black kids growing up in the White House for eight years, who watched Michelle Obama on TV every night for eight years, not to mention Obama himself. And then those people become grown-ups. I think that that will change the terms of the debate uh, over race in this country and what we draw from studies like the Brookings one when we read about them in the paper. And I really, and also the energizing of the electorate, those are the things that really move me, I must admit, more than anything about who has a plan about health care, who would negotiate with the leaders of Iran or not, and under what conditions. To me, that we must get past this color line issue. And therefore, for me, I'm for Obama, and I'm almost sad that Hillary cannot represent anything like that for me, but she can't. And yeah, Obama is certainly more charming. That's somebody who can get people interested in politics, whereas Hillary Clinton, with all of her brilliance and competence, never could. It's a shame, but it's just there. Yeah, I have to say, for me, the uh, the core issue is, because uh, I'm, I'm fairly libertarian in my politics, but mm-hmm. the core issue for me is that his economic, he's got sort of an economic dream team, um, a lot of them from Chicago, where I went to business school. His team, and yeah. So I, I basically I vote the advisors. I don't I don't vote. I figure if he's smart enough to pick uh, professors I like, he's he's smart <laughs> enough to listen to them in office. And the, the, he also he really displays this interest in listening to people in a way that you know. I mean, Bill Clinton was mm-hmm. also reputed. He was same wealthy. thing. Yeah. And and uh, so I, that that actually excites me. But I, I like. I like Obama. I like the people that Obama will be listening to better than I like the people that Bill Clinton was listening to. That is definitely true. Yeah, he's a a thinker. He he, he likes to bring people together, definitely. But I also think, I mean, I'm also, I have to admit, just excited by the fact that, you know, I think if this race had been run 10 years ago, right, we would have been talking about, well, can a black man win in America? Mm -hmm. And now what we're talking about is, does he have an unfair advantage against Hillary because (laughs) he's black? Exactly. And that's pretty exciting, actually. Isn't it? We've gotten to that point. Isn't Um, it? It's been the most, it's been the most fascinating thing for me because I don't, I don't really call my, I'm not a political pundit. You know, not too long ago I was just a linguist sitting in my apartment and I try to follow the news, but A year ago, I knew this was going to happen. I was thinking, his color will work for him. All these magazine stories about whether America is ready, of course America is ready. All you had to do was watch audiences in front of him and realize that 1992 was a very long time ago. And I would just tell people, do you realize that this guy really might be our next president? And a year ago, less than a year ago, people would look off into the distance and shake their heads and say America wasn't ready. They really couldn't imagine what happened in Iowa. They didn't think that could happen in 2000. 
2008. And it looked perfectly plausible to me, and I had it a year ago. I said one thing is nobody's going to be able to criticize him, because if you throw too much mud, it's going to look like beating up on a black man, and particularly a rather light-skinned and very charming one with a nice smile. Nobody will tolerate it. And so the mud and the Clinton machine will be utterly irrelevant. It will help him to be black. And I think if you take a picture of him in your head and you morph it and make him white, and I said this a year and a half ago and everybody hated me for it, but I'm going to say it again. If he were white, I don't think he would be getting this kind of attention. I think his color is definitely an advantage. And yes, isn't that wonderful? Who would have thunk it 40 years ago, even 30, even 20? But yeah, we're at a special moment. It really is exciting in that way. I have to say, you know, some of the Hillary people definitely seem like they're... uh they're very, they, they think this is unfair. Like, I've, I've heard Hillary people sort of say, well, hmm. you know, he chose to be black. Hmm. Um, hmm. You know, he, he was, that he grew up not in black culture and white culture, and he's deliberate. Right. And, and, you know, I, I sort of sit there and listen to it, and I go, okay, and? I, I think, what's, <laughs> what's the point? Um, right. But I do actually want to ask, I mean, what do you think, do you think that the fact that he's light-skinned helps him? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, take a picture of him and make him darker. You know, I viscerally, I would have to say that I think it does help him to not be too dark. I don't think that it's decisive. I think it would be possible for a chocolate-colored Obama to have gotten as far. But it certainly doesn't hurt that what he looks like is what he is, half white, half black. And so, therefore, he represents all of us. And to the extent that there is any sense that a dark-skinned black person is threatening, and I think there is less of that than a lot of black people would say there is, but it's there, Obama does have that advantage. Maybe America would be a little less ready for a chocolate-colored president. But then again, imagining if it's the exact same person, except he's got some more melanin, I'm not sure it would make that much of a difference. But it certainly doesn't hurt that he is... Yeah, about the color of me, because it looks in between. It looks in between. I think that does make people comfortable. Um, well, this is a, possibly a good point to transition to something that I'm a huge fan of. Your book, um, doing your own thing, which you you said was like your failed book. <laughs> you're, right? you're one of the few who seems to like that one, but I enjoyed writing it. Yeah, thank you um, for reading it. It was I, I. You know, I got it. I got it uh, a couple a, about a couple months ago, and I, I finally picked it up and read it. And it's just fascinating to me. So the book uh, for people, actually, what, what it, could you summarize uh, for the people who haven't had the, the benefit of reading it? Uh, what, sure. What's it about? Doing Our Own Thing was subtitled um, the, um, the Degradation of Language and Music and Why You Should Like Care. And I wrote it, um, that was 2003. And a lot of people picked it up thinking that I was going to write one more book saying that people don't speak well nowadays, what's up with that? And that's not what the book was about. What I was trying to say was, it was kind of an anthropological book, really. I was saying a 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, there was a sense in America that when you use language in public or when you write it, you do it in a very formal, stylized, tightly monitored way that was different from the way people have always spoken. So it's not that anybody ever talked like people do in a Henry James novel casually, but that there was this formal, casual split. And I wrote about how speeches used to be orations, and now people just talk. And I wrote about how magazine and newspaper writing used to be, you know, kind of brilliant, carefully crafted prose, and now it's just kind of gray paper mache. And I was just writing about how there was that difference, and I said that there were advantages to it, and there were disadvantages to it. And I was just making that observation. I just thought it was interesting to see how different the linguistic culture of America used to be. And I used examples from movies, and I had a chapter on poetry, and I wrote about old popular song lyrics. And it wasn't really meant to be very judgmental. And actually, that made a lot of people angry. It's funny, there, I got some real hate mail for that one. And it, yeah, and, it, and what's interesting is that book wasn't about race, so it wasn't me being the quote-unquote controversialist I'm also called, often called being. It was language, it was pop culture. With, you know, my hobby, I love old stuff. I love vintage American pop culture. In my real life, I spend a lot more time than I think most people would 
would intuit doing things like playing old songs on the piano, watching ancient movies. That's me, not making people angry about race. That's I'm with you. And the first thing I do when I move is check whether I can get Turner Classic Movies. Yes, you system. too. <laughs> Isn't it yes. wonderful? Yeah. And so, do, yeah, that's it. Doing Our Own Thing was based on somebody who likes TCM. That's what it was. And, yeah, it was, um, I guess I'm, my publishers wouldn't want me to say this, but, yeah, it didn't do that well. I think it's my one major book that's out of print. And my family and friends never finish it. You know, they, they deny it, but they don't. And I love it. <laughs> I enjoyed it, so I'm glad that you're reading it. Well, I mean, I think, you know, it was funny, actually. Uh, right before I read it, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who said, well, you know, uh, movies just got better after method acting um, mm. came in. And I, I thought, you know, uh, and Terry Teachout, who's a you know, yeah, critic for the, the Wall Street Journal, once said to me, that people think that the acting in, in 40s movies is wrong, and it's not. It's just a different, it's a style. It's very, very and, and no one in the movie is really expected that, you know, uh, thugs went around talking like Humphrey Bogart did. Exactly. It was, a, it was they, they were sort of interacting with it in a way, in the same way that, that um, people used to interact with the speeches of Williams, Jennings, Bryan, or whatever. Exactly. Um, so, so about a, so the reason I, I, I wanted to bring this up, although I am going to digress, actually just a little bit uh, before I do, I mm -hmm. want to talk about Obama. But before that, you just made a really interesting observation that I'd never sort of thought about about writing. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I do for a living in oral cultures, mm -hmm. and the way that um, the way that sentences are constructed in oral cultures, how different right. it is exactly. from the way that they're. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's that casual speech is really composed less of sentences than utterances, that we generally speak and process speech in packets of about seven or eight words at a time. Like if you replayed what I've just said, I'm doing the way people actually talk. And that the written sentence with all of the subordinate clauses and things like that is kind of an artifice. If you look at the earliest writing, the earliest writing in human history is short, re relatively simple sentences, for example, the Hebrew Bible. And the way that we often write is based on the fact that when you read, you can look back, you have time to process. And there's a massive difference. But because we are in a culture of writing, we often suppose that the way language looks on the page is the way we, we speak or maybe the way that we should speak when actually there is a massive difference. Now, the, the, I wonder, it's, it's actually interesting because the speeches of Williams, Jennings, Bryan, you would think in a society that was, much, that was less literate, mm -hmm. they would be less complicated. But that you know, <laughs> sort of peaked in the, in the late 19th century, right, this flowery rhetoric, and yep. it's, it's been on a decline ever since. Yeah. Um, but uh, is Obama bringing us back, or is he also an informal... Speaker is. I mean, is he is he ratcheting up the level of of, uh, of rhetoric? Do you think? Frankly, no. Actually, it's interesting. If I did a revised version of doing our own thing, there would of course have to be some riffs on Obama, who nobody had heard of when I wrote that book. And actually, he's channeling into our modern sense of what a speech is, because William Jennings Bryan got up and gave a very crafted performance using a lot of $10 words and tapeworm sentences. And that was considered ordinary, and especially because there were no microphones in that time. You had to get up and use a stage voice and use a highly theatrical kind of presence. Obama's different because he comes after the mid-60s, and the kind of speech that he makes is one that takes a page from the fundamentalist preaching tradition, and that's both white and black. And so with Obama, what he is moving people with is partly a matter of melody, but in particular it's a black preacherly melody, which I think today drives people nuts in a good way, and that's white people as well as black people. We all have Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech in our mental iPod, so to speak, and that's considered well, I have stirring. to say, like, I had never, for years, I'd never read, I'd never heard the speech. I'd only read really? it. Really? Uh, and I thought I found it moving on paper, but then one day on Martin Luther King Day, I turned on the radio and I heard the whole speech for the first time, and I cried. Isn't it amazing? Because it's it's just so much more moving when spoken than with the it melody. Is. That's right. Yeah. And Obama is also using short sentences. You know, all of these these slogans, and this is what one does. This is the way one moves an audience. But if it were a hundred years ago, he'd be giving these very dense 
orations, and that's what would be considered a good speech. Now, I don't say that that's good or bad, because the orations back then were exciting in their way, but they were impersonal, and you could actually dress up very minor points in those big words. You know, you could use that kind of language to obfuscate, whereas today you have to be more direct. Then, on the other hand, today's format is not one where you can get across any kind of sustained point in any real way. And so it, it, it goes back and forth. But Obama is using spoken kinds of speeches, and he's doing it very well, and he's doing what he has to do to get elected. Hillary Clinton does that sort of thing less. She would like to get up and give a policy paper, and she's losing. Yeah, I, have, I hadn't thought about that before, that the, 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 the change in the style of our speeches actually does make it harder to get across sort of a, a real policy point. You, no. you can say, like, I want to do health care, <laughs> but it's, it's harder to, to say something more complicated than that. Yeah, preachers um, don't get across long, sustained points. That's not what preaching is about. And so to the extent that our public speeches are going to be considered really exciting in that they channel the church preacherly style, then we're going to have to have chunkier kind of information. You can't talk about health care when you're getting applause lines every two utterances. That's, that just won't work. So we're going to have to get that from writing and from websites, and speeches are going to have to be different. Right. And it's interesting that Hillary does better in the, you know, she's perceived as doing better in the debates, mm -hmm. uh, where Obama is perceived as doing better when, when he delivers a speech. I think the, uh, mm -hmm. the economist wrote that uh, people keep remarking on the fact that he doesn't do, he, his debate isn't as compelling as his speeches, mm -hmm. which is kind of like uh, saying that it's hard to play Ode to Joy on the spoons. <laughs> um, That's right. That is very true. And she, yeah, I mean, it gets back to the fact that she really is as qualified for this as he is. But who gets people in their guts? And you know, human beings have always loved music. Human beings have always loved rhythm. And that's what we're dealing with at this point. And it also comes back to that the black cultural essence is tied into those things in a way that a white girl growing up middle class in Illinois in the 1950s is unlikely to be able to channel as much. Black is very cool right now. People who don't understand that need to imagine. This is the sort of thing I talked about in doing our own thing. It's 1925, and someone gets up in front of a white audience and starts giving a speech where they're doing preacherly cadences and, you know, eliciting applause lines. To many people, that would not have qualified as a speech. Now, in the South, Huey Long was doing that. That was regional. But the United States of America giving a speech like that in Boston and white college students going crazy, that was not the way America was. Things have changed in terms of what black is thought to be. Black is America in many ways right now. And I, I suppose the black style, the black preacher style, goes back to the fact that it wasn't necessarily a literate community, and so mm -hmm. you know the preachers were using these shorter sentences and these these back and forth lines because there was a, there was a specifically white evangelical style too. Exactly, yes. different, same thing. Um, it's you know it's got its own rhythm and its own. Uh, I, I would say I find it less appealing, but you know that just <laughs> goes into black is cool. <laughs> right. um, but uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I, th I think that uh, Hillary is definitely at a disadvantage there in a way that... Uh, so I, I would say, actually, I think Obama is also the better candidate, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, which is fortunate, right? It is. It's a lucky, it's a lucky thing. Yeah, I actually, yeah, I, I would disagree very politely with you on that in terms of who gives evidence of themselves being the best person, despite Obama's team, and I hope that he would listen to them. I do value Hillary Clinton's longer experience in the Senate, more active performance in the Senate, actually, than Obama has had a chance to do. And she was, you know, sitting in the White House for eight years. And even though she didn't manage to do health care successfully, she watched things. She was she was there. I would you know, if I were picking in terms of a computer I would say I would put my bet on her more than him. But the difference is minor. I mean, it's not as if she is vastly a better candidate than him. But uh, you wouldn't say that she even has him by a nose or a hair? Well, I, I think that, you know, the experience can cut both ways, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Brad DeLong has written about this, about the fact that health, the health care thing was a disaster for a very specific reason, mm -hmm. which is that she just didn't listen to anyone. Right. right? And she sort of bowled ahead... Um, and obviously, you know, she's older now. She's, she's learned. Been in the Senate. She's been, people learn, and she's been cooperating and, and so forth. Um, but, you know, so you can say she's got negative as well as positive experience. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I think, I guess what it is, is ultimately for me, I feel like, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly libertarian and, mm-hmm. and I see in Barack Obama, just, he's interested in outcomes and he's interested in sort of distributional justice and a mm-hmm. lot of left things. Mm-hmm. But the way he wants to get them, get to them, I think is a very sort of market oriented way yeah. of just doing little tweaks and simple rule changes and tra- right. a lot of transparency, a lot of accountability. Right. Because I see Hillary wanting, you know, I mean, like her mortgage plan. We're just going to freeze interest rates for five years. Right. right. And this is sort of, this is crazy stuff. I mean, Barack has his own crazy stuff with the mm-hmm. Economic Patriot Act. But, um, mm-hmm. uh, and I do wish, I mean, the one thing I, d- I wish really hard about Obama is that you know, his advisors are basically sort of trailing around behind him, telling people he's lying, don't listen to him about trade. Right. Um, which is sort of disturbing because I obviously care about trade a lot. But I, you know, she's a technocrat. Yes. And I find that, I don't like that. Um, mm-hmm. On foreign policy, it's, it's possibly a different story, but that's sort of less of my area, and I sort of try to vote right. what I know. That's right. Um, and, and, and McCain, too. Like, I, I actually, you know, I don't feel like McCain gets markets at all. I feel like he's, you know, he bought sort of the conservative combo pack yes. that came with the market ideology. But what he really, all, all he really wanted was the national greatness, conservatism, and sort of exactly. moderate social. So, I mean, that, that's why I like Obama's. I feel like he, you know, he may not like the outcomes of markets, all that, but he respects them, and he respects how they work. That is definitely, that is definitely true. I suppose there's a part of me that, likes the technocrat approach because I feel that hard-nosed realism and moderate expectations, there's a place for that as opposed to the idealism, etc. I, I often have a hard time with idealism. But I certainly, I, certainly see, I certainly see where you're coming from. McCain is interesting, though, because I have always said that um, I would not be against voting for a Republican. I've often thought of him as the one that I could consider voting for, because I think it's really poisonous in the black community that, you know, we're such a cheap date in terms of always voting for one party and then wondering why no party is truly interested in our concerns. But of course, you know, ten minutes ago, McCain was considered a dead letter, and so I didn't really have to think of that very much. But now here we go, and it's going to, obviously, it's going to be McCain as the alternative. And I have been trying to hold myself accountable, and I've been trying to think, would I really rather have him then let's presume that Obama is going to be the nominee, then Obama. And I haven't really worked this out yet, but I realize that I do have some thinking to do, because on the one hand, there is my wage issue of race, but in a way, that's a little bit parochial. And in terms of who I would really want running the country, I'm not sure that I consider McCain absolutely out of court, or at least I'm going to have to make sure that I'm being honest with myself if it comes to that. Well, I have to say, I think this is going to be, I, I was just musing on this the other day, it's going to be a really exciting race. Oh, whichever, yeah. Because you finally got, you, you think about Kerry and Bush, mm-hmm. which was uh, which reminded me of, uh, of P.J. Rourke's line, you know, imagine that you were wrongfully accused of murder and either of these guys showed up as your court-appointed attorney, sort of hello, lethal injection. <laughs> um, and, and, and But people didn't really like either of them. You know, they were right. voting, there was tribal, and maybe they thought Bush would be better at X, Y, or Z. But they didn't love him. They weren't no. excited by him. And no. people are excited by McCain, and they're excited by Obama. So I, I'm, I'm interested to see how this race is going to turn out. And, uh, and I'm exciting. in D.C. for the first time. I just moved here a year ago. So oh, neat. the first election that I've been through, and it's really, uh, it's, it's the place to be. It must be. And, yeah, this is going to be one of the most exciting elections, I think, of yours or my lifetimes. It's actually something worth following. You know, I kind of, I held my nose and voted for Kerry, but he was not somebody who anybody could ever be excited about. Again, partly just because he doesn't happen to be charming and the way his facial muscles happen to be arranged. Right. And that's not his fault, but nevertheless it was the case. But, yeah, this one is really something. It's really interesting to follow it on a daily basis, and it's not predictable. If Obama and McCain go at it, there is not, nothing glib that can be said. It's really going to be a serious battle. Both of them are going to have to work hard, and all of us, I think, are going to have a lot of thinking to do. So it's it's going it's good for journalists. We have uh, yeah, we have a is. lot of interesting things to write about instead of just the the grim back and forth. Of- you know, yeah, it's interesting. I feel almost guilty about that in a way. Like as a jur- as a journalist of sorts, who's often asked to comment about race, Katrina. 
you know, I hate to say it, but it gave race writers a bounce. You found yourself always being asked to do things. Then that that ended. That stopped being a hot story. And Obama definitely is a writing opportunity. It's not something that you take advantage of consciously. But yeah, it gives you a lot to think about, and it gives you a lot of directions to go. So yeah, definitely that is part of why all this is so exciting. Um, well, we have our, our last topic, which uh, also goes to language and. Uh, um, and speaking of speaking of uh, unfortunate outcomes of, of uh, uncontrolled processes, uh, <laughs> buying languages. Oh yes, yes. Um, the last speaker of a of an Eskimo language mm-hmm. called uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I think Ayak. Uh, Ayak. Yeah. Uh, died recently, mm-hmm. and this this brought forth a spate of uh, sort of editorials and, and blog posts from Language Log, of which I'm a huge fan. Mm-hmm. Um, on what what we should do, if anything, about dying languages and what it means to have these sort of unique ways of thinking go out of the world. Yeah, yeah. That's a tough one because I think the PC answer is we should try to keep people speaking these languages as much as we can. But there are all sorts of things to be said, and we have limited time, but I would just say that um, the idea of keeping alive these 6,000 languages is not practicable if we are going to have globalization and urbanization, if people are going to be brought together physically into large cities, or if people are just going to be brought, even in the abstract sense, into the larger economy, then the small languages end up disappearing because the small languages are the languages of small tribal groups, and when that existence ceases to be or changes vastly, naturally the language will go away, especially because of a basic process. If speaker of language A and a speaker of language B come together in a city and they have kids, the kids may learn language A and or language B, but they probably won't learn it very well. They're going to learn the language of the city. And then with the next generation, forget it. And to say that all of these groups should preserve their language is often saying that these groups should be kind of preserved as museum dioramas cut off from the progress in, say, women's rights and health care that we first worlders have. And so as a linguist, I think that all of these languages are fascinating. The media tends to hold on to the fact that there are these words that each language has, because if, if you're not a linguist, it's hard to really get into the nuts and bolts of the grammar. But the way the grammar of AOC worked was absolutely fascinating. But in order to preserve them, we'd have to preserve an earlier state of humanity when we were just hundreds of thousands of tribes coding the globe. What we're seeing is that we're all coming together, and to the extent that that's a good thing, we're going to have to have fewer languages and and more to the point. The fact is that trying to teach an adult the language of their group or their tribe is really, it's impossible, especially because the smaller a language is, the more complex and overgrown it tends to be, which is fascinating. Really? Yeah, it's, you'd think that you know English is complicated, and then if you have a small group that got a simpler language for, quote-unquote, a simpler life. Actually, if you are looking at a language spoken by some group who live way off in the forest and haven't had much contact with outsiders, it tends to be so complicated that you can't imagine how anybody would speak it. There's one language spoken by a group in Papua New Guinea, the Beric. Their language, when you when you when you say a verb, you have to indicate when you're talking about an action what time whether or not the person did this thing when the sun was up or not. And you have to say that just like we have to talk about whether it was in the present, past, or future. They have that too, but also whether the sun was up. And you have to talk about the gender of the person you gave something to. All of that is in their endings and prefixes that they use on the verb. And so that's neat. But if you take somebody from Beric society, and for some reason they were taken away from it, and then they want to learn the Beric language at the age of 30, uh, that's never happened with this particular group. You can't, because we're all busy. You lose the ability to learn a language quickly and well after your mid-teens anyway. I did it once with a group of Native Americans, and there was a program. And we had a great time with numbers and learning some basic things. But I remember thinking, there's no way that they could learn this language in their 50s. It's too complicated. It's too different. No one could do this. And so that's another thing. That there's an irreversible aspect to this. Yeah, there's that, there's that famous, the wind talkers, right? They, oh, yeah. they wanted an unbreakable code. They just got people to speak Hopi to each other That's right. during World War II. Yeah, and it was lucky because they had spoken it all their lives. Go through a grammatical description of Hopi. The, the occasional hobbyist or obsessive or uniquely talented person could learn viable Hopi as an adult. You have to be a real language fan. But the idea that thousands and thousands of people would regularly do it when everybody is so busy and has other things to do. Sadly, 
that cannot be. And I really say sadly, because these languages are very interesting. But AOC happened to get that bump, I think, partly because of the story in The Economist. But a language dies about every two weeks. This is a, a standard thing. Uh, most This continent, you know, there were about 300 Native American languages used in what is today America, and all but a few of them are hanging on by a thread now. So it's a very, it's a very common process, but I'm afraid it's part of modernity. And it's just there, there's, certain, there's a certain amount of diversity in the language sense that we just can't have if we are to progress as a species, if we can call what we're doing progress, and that's a whole different issue. Now, you said that there are, uh, there are now 6,000 languages that mm-hmm. you think are going to go down to 600 by the end of, yep. end of the century? That is the figure that's often given. And, of course, it's just a projection. But tiny languages are disappearing very quickly, and to the extent that a, t- that a group of people speaking a tiny language become modern and join quote unquote civilization, the language is often threatened. And once you've gotten to the point that it's not being passed on to kids, it's gone. You know, it, so you can have a situation where thousands of people in their 50s are using it, but if the kids aren't using it and instead they're speaking Portuguese if they're in the Amazon, or they're speaking Chinese if they're in China and they're part of some small group, then you're in trouble, unfortunately. So, yeah, we're probably going to go down to, you know, maybe about 500, 600 languages, and hopefully we can preserve the others in books and grammatical descriptions, and that'll be something interesting. But the cultures themselves, I think, if we value diversity, then what we, and if we value diversity in the sense of people being diverse in each other's presence, the fact is when people come together, they have a common language, and people don't stay multilingual just for fun. And right. when there are less reasons for that to happen, fewer reasons for that to happen, then multilingualism tends to erode, and there we are. Yeah, I'm, I'm Irish uh, by descent. Ah. And, you know, Ireland is trying to revive, and it's Gaelic, sort yeah. of working. I actually know people who are sending their kids to Irish-only schools who do not themselves speak Irish. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it seems in, ultimately no one wants to speak Irish as their primary language mm-hmm. because English is the language of commerce, and yeah. it's what sort of makes for... Um, and I don't think it means that, that culture has to die out. No. Because the Irish still have their own culture. Right? Exactly. Despite the fact that they speak English. Exactly. Yeah, that's the thing. The culture can live on. And Gaelic is an interesting example because there are about a half dozen examples of languages that are being, where there are revival efforts, where it's kind of working, but the fact is that the idea of all or most people in Ireland going around using Gaelic as their everyday medium of communication and English kind of being on the ropes. That simply can't happen because history has happened whether people like it or not. And so I think Gaelic hangs on in a kind of an interesting intermediate stage. It's kind of a taught language, a school language. A lot of people have learned it, kind of like in America. A lot of people know French, although I think the Gaelic movement has gone beyond that. Same thing with Welsh in Wales, and so it's admirable, but the idea that the Hebrew story is going to happen in thousands of other cases around the world, I don't think that can be. Hebrew was a very unique circumstance because of the religious impulse, people coming together into one place. That's not happening with Maori and Cornish and Welsh and Gaelic. And I don't think that it ever can. So it's it's Cornish a bitter. Cornish has already situation. died out, right? It's Cornish like is gone. Five. Yeah, but there is a movement. You know, there are people who are really? speaking Cornish to their kids, and there are. But it tends to be it's an admirable movement. But can Cornish really ever come back as a language that people are using as a da- as a daily medium of communication? It seems unlikely. It, it's the province of hobbyists and you know people who are interested in the culture and reviving it. That will always be a minority population. As interesting like Esperanto. as Esperanto, for example, yeah, yeah. It's it's people who have a particular interest. So yeah, how these things are good, but yeah. You know. How different are these languages? I mean, a lot of these languages are they? What's the you know what's the distinction between a language and a dialect? Oh I suppose Lord. it's more a matter of <laughs> art than science, but it's a continuum, and sometimes. It, well, basically, you can have people converse in Norwegian, Danish, and Swedish. They are dialects of what you could call one language, but they're spoken in different countries. Mandarin and Cantonese are as different as French and Italian. They're called dialects of Chinese because they are written with the Chinese writing system and they're spoken in China. But in terms of um, Welsh and Cornish are closely related. I'm making a 
a thumbnail guess that Welsh and Cornish are kind of like French and Italian, and then Gaelic is much different from them, but all of them belong to a subfamily called Celtic, and they work along a similar plan. And then there's Breton, which is spoken across the English Channel down in France. And Breton and Cornish are kind of like Spanish and Italian. They're very similar. So all these things vary. But sort of like half the languages in the world are spoken in Papua New Guinea or something, right? <laughs> it's actually, uh, doing a quick calculation, it is something like an eighth. Yeah, I mean, depending on what you call a language, there are about 800 languages spoken in... In, in New Guinea, it's alarming. 300 in Nigeria. And even Timor, which always makes the news, that island is about the size of the room I'm in right now. And there are over a dozen languages spoken on it, and two more were discovered last year. So in many languages in the world, most of them are not going to be long for this world, unfortunately. Uh, my, my last question, what do we lose when... You, know, you often hear people say uh, that... There are some thoughts that just can't be expressed outside of a language, and this used to drive my, my <laughs> colleague uh, Lane Green at the my old colleague Lane Green at the Economist, who by the way is a huge fan of yours. Oh, good. Um, this used to he's a sort of language buff mm-hmm. and sort of picks up Arabic for fun. <laughs> um, language head, I call that. Yeah. Yes, it used to drive him nuts when people would say this. Mm-hmm. Um, so what what do we lose um, when when a language goes away? Like what? What sorts of what goes out of the world? I guess is the you know there's certain yeah. I Megan, it's funny because there's a certain answer one is supposed to give to that. I have a book coming out on the history of English later this year where I actually have a whole chapter about this because what I'm supposed to say is that for example, Aok died, and because Aok had a word for ice that's thin so that it would break if you stood on it, that we're losing a cultural viewpoint. But really, the fact is that. The extent to which languages carve up reality and have particular words or expressions for things is, to a large extent, random and doesn't really have anything to do with what I would call a cultural outlook. Like, I don't think it's cultural to have a word for when the ice is thin. You know, we talk about thin ice, Aok had one word. I don't know what that says about the essence of a person. Or, for example, we have a word for when someone is with their significant other at a party and they hang close to that person because they don't want someone to come on to that person. And we call that hovering. We have a word for it. Now, in a great many languages, there is no word for what we call hovering. We have that in English. Is that anything about our culture? You know, surely there are people in India, in Thailand, in Papua New Guinea who hover, but they don't happen to have a word for it. They would have to say, staying close to my partner because I don't want someone else to hit on them. We say hover. I think that's an accident. Many people would say that there's something cultural about it. I don't get it. And so as long as these things are encoded in dictionaries and things, as far as I'm concerned, we have done our job. Um, And I know that's a boring answer, but that's how I really feel. Well, do we have dictionaries for most of these languages now? I mean, are people reporting them, or are they, or do we have this the thing where you know, like species go extinct, mm-hmm. or scientists say they think species are going extinct? They've never actually found the species. They're kind of <laughs> guessing that it's there and also going extinct. That's right. We, um, I don't know the figure for how many languages have been described um, in any real way. I'll bet that it's less than half. I know that for most languages, there's at least a word list and some text. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And despite what I'm saying about languages' disappearance, I should mention that linguists are very are very engaged in documenting languages. That's part of what linguists do, because it certainly is interesting to have the documentation there. And missionaries are also engaged in that kind of effort as well. And so I'm not sure what the figure is. I don't think it's going to be the case that every language that dies is going to be captured. There are those that die went before anybody really had a chance to document them in any serious way. There was one Romance language called Dalmatian that died a very long time ago, and the only documentation that we got from it, we got of it, was from a man who didn't have any teeth by the time they got to him, and so there are questions about the sounds, you know, that that's, that, that sort of thing does happen. But we're trying. We are definitely trying, but yeah, it is sometimes it is a matter of fighting a rising tide and that's unfortunate. Well, I see that we are uh, we are just about out of time, but uh, Oh, look at that, we are. Yeah. <laughs> this has been uh, very enjoyable for me. I'm I'm an enormous fan of yours. So, I'm glad, uh, Megan. I've been it's been good to get to know you. Yes, and uh, 
take care, and I guess we'll we'll uh, we'll see how the election goes. Yeah, let's let's watch it together. <laughs> I'll be watch I'll be watching to see what you do about McCain. Yeah, we shall see. We shall. I see. want to see a public declaration. <laughs> we I there there actually I there just might be one, and I wish you the best with your reunion with your puppy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Take care. You too, Megan. Bye bye.